Um, okay, so uh, I'm Howard Tom, as you probably know, I'm at the University of Bristol, and this is a, a bit of work that somewhat builds on what Nishin will present to you next, um, where, where we worked to use the HESIM package to implement a, uh, a general micro simulation in R. And this, we collaborated with Devin and Sergi, who developed the HESIM package, and also Linda Hunt and Elsa Marcus at Bristol. So the research question is, what's the most cost-effective um, prosthetic knee implant for patients uh, categorized with different age and gender groups? Uh, we used UK National Joint Registry data on revision rates, utilities. Uh, we used hospital list prices for costs. Uh, same question and data as before means same question that Yishin will talk to you in a moment. In a moment. So this is a cohort Markov model that represents this problem where patients are um, different numbers of years after their initial total knee replacement. Um, if they have a revision in the early time, they go into a post-early stage. Uh, if they're in three to 10 years, they go to post-middle and beyond 10 years, they go into a late revision. There's also a second revision state and a death state. So this is the cohort Markov model representation. Um, so we were thinking to change this um, model from a cohort Markov model into, from a cohort model into an individual level micro simulation to switch from using discrete time. So not one month or one year time cycles into continuous time, then not to be Markov, not to be semi Markov, but to be full history dependence. So we're sort of going to a general micro simulation in continuous time. And the model actually looks a bit simpler when you write it this way, um, that we've got a post total knee replacement state, a post first revision state, then a post second revision state, and then two types of death. Um, the state transition micro simulation in continuous time, because we can now, we don't have to categorize time since um, initial surgery, we can fit a general spline model to the revision rates. So we use splines for the time to first revision, and we used a spline for time to second revision, and the spline and second revision is dependent on the time that they went from uh, their initial surgery to the first revision. So it's a covariate adjusted spline model. Uh, so it's not a semi Markov model because in um, a, so in a Markov model, transition rates can only depend on the time a patient spends in the model. Um, and this clock uh, continues forward regardless of their transitions between states. So that's why they often call it a clock forward model. And this is the language used by HESIM. Uh, in a semi-Markov model, the transition rates are able to depend on the time you spend in the state, and that time resets after you enter each state, so we call it clock reset. Otherwise, a semi-Markov model is like a Markov model, and transition rates do not otherwise depend on history. In a general microsimulation, transitions can depend on the entire history of the path through the model. Um, and do we mean discrete event simulation? Well, a state transition micro simulation models states rather than events, but the transitions to these states are just events. So actually a discrete state, state transition micro simulation model in continuous time is equivalent to a discrete event simulation in continuous time. So these are really just exactly the same types of models. There are minor differences in how competing risks are implemented, and it's common in DES to include resource constraints. Um, but the resource constraint is not a serious issue in knee replacement surgery. There are huge delays for um, getting that surgery, but the, those delays aren't changed by using a different implant. So it doesn't have an impact on the actual decision problem. But DES models, if you're interested, they're implemented in SIMR and DESM, and Cohen Degelin runs a really excellent course um, for ISPR on that type of modeling in R. So my implementation is in HESIM, the, the package developed by Devon and Surti. Um, it supports cohort Markov models in discrete time. It supports partition survival models, and it, can, it supports semi-Markov micro simulations in continuous time. Um, it uses uh, RCPP and data table to um, be very efficient. So it allows both micro simulation and probabilistic sensitivity analysis. And it's really well documented. There are lots of nice big nets, including one on cohort Markov model in hip replacement surgery. But it doesn't implement general micro simulations. It only does semi-Markov modeling. 
Now, the project can be fully downloaded from this um, GitHub repository, and um, you're encouraged to download it and have a look at the code as you go through. Uh, the main script to open is the nips main 2.r and excuse my awful version control in github um, but it's there is it a private repository it shouldn't be a public it's not showing up on the github ah <coughs> it's supposed to be okay it's supposed to be public apologies So the model uses, so the GitHub will be continued in the bottom right and I'll make it public pretty much today. Um, so the model uses a lot of unique steps, but the steps are really common to all HESIM models. So um, if you know how to do a HESIM model, you'll understand briefly what I'm trying to do. But in brief, these are the steps that these types of models need. You call a HESIM data function that creates the HESIM dash object, and that defines the strategies, the patients and the states of your model. Once you've done that, you define a T-match or transition matrix. This just tells you which transitions are allowed between states. You then need to create a param serve list, uh, which is just a list of survival distributions that go that represent the different transitions on these states. They can be um, piecewise exponential or constant. Uh, they can be splines, they can be beta, uh, sorry, beta. Yeah, they can be pretty much anything. And it utilizes a lot of distributions implemented in the effect serve package. Once you've defined that, you call the create individual continuous time transitions function. Um, so HESIM is implemented in an object-oriented system. So it has, you create these objects of transition models. And once you've created the object transition model, you can call the sim disease function, which simulates the disease progression. Um, so this disease progression object uh, only represents disease. It doesn't tell us about utilities or costs. So there's a couple of other functions you need to call to do the costs and the utility models. And once you've got the lifetime costs, lifetime qualities, you can just analyze them uh, using some of the built-in ESIM functions or use uh, BCA or whatever package or base R version you'd like to use. So what I've these are hacks. Um, because the, I started using the package thinking, okay, great, this will do everything for me. Um, and I don't need to write lots of custom code. Uh, and then I discovered, oh no, it's not doing exactly what I need. So how do I get HeSIM to do what I need it to do? And this is a common problem I, I alluded to earlier with packages, that if you don't do exactly what you need, it can be a lot of fact to change it. Um, so again, um, I might just see if I can make the repository public now. Actually, no, I can't, I can't log in. Um, okay, so look at the script, code generate model outputs um, 3.r, but basically there's a function generate model outputs that loops over each of the implants and then fits a param serve list um, for each of these implants. The reason it needs to be done independently is that the splines for each of the uh, implants were fit independently to the data. It wasn't fit with some covariate adjustment so there's no assumption of proportional hazards. And this was a thing that was not implemented in HESIM. It assumed all the splines were fit to the same data and just differentiated by covariates. But if you had independent splines, you need to fit them a bit differently. Um, it then, for the first round, it uses this model to simulate the time to the first revision. So it uses the existing splines and says, okay, how long does it take to get to first revision? It then saves that. Uh, so sorry, it uses it's used a particular set seed, and then it runs these simulations and works out how long it takes to get to the first revision. It then changes the covariate going into the model and says, okay, use this as the covariate, even though it hasn't happened yet, uh, to adjust the time to second revision. So that's how we're able to get the second revision uh, spline to depend on the time to first revision. And if you use the set seed, you'll get the same times to first revision the second time you run the whole model. So we've had to use two runs of HESIM to do this um, dependence on time to first revision. Then it, it puts the list back together and combines the disease progression objects, simulates utilities and costs, and that's the cost effectiveness analysis, um, which was a bit of a faff, um, but it worked. And I don't know if it was any faster than if I'd just written it in base R from the beginning. Um, 
Now, that's not the only um, issue that I found. Um, so the time to first revision is a covariate. This depends on the random sample because the splines are actually probabilistic. They're sampled from a joint distribution of the um, the cover of the coefficients. Um, but in HESIM, uh, covariates only differ by individuals, not by samples. So although different times to first revision were sampled, they couldn't be allowed to vary by the individuals because HESIM doesn't recognize differences between individuals uh, that vary only by the sample. Uh, so the messy solution was that instead of modeling a thousand samples of a thousand patients, uh, we model a million samples of the same individual and then at the end, relabel them again so that there are a thousand samples of each of the individuals. Um, another issue is that mortality. So in HESIM, all the transitions out of each stage have to be either clock reset or clock forward. So if one of the transitions, like uh, background mortality, that depends on your age. So that doesn't depend on the time you entered the stage. It depends on the time you've been in the model because it depends on how old you are. Um, whereas the revision rates depend on how long you spent in the state. So uh, in HESIM, that wouldn't be allowed. And to do that, we had to use that simulated time to first revision to offset the life table mortality um, to say that, okay, one of them is depending on the time of the model, one of them is depending on the time of the state. So that was another hack. Um, and if you look in it, you see there's this offset, offset piecewise exponential model, which offsets the background mortality. Um, so before I go to what I've learned, I might just show you the model running um, to prove it's not all fake. Uh, pardon? Oh, perfect. Okay. So this is the code, this is the NIPS main 2.r file that hopefully by the time I'm back at my regular computer tonight, I can make the whole GitHub repository public and you can all play with it if you actually wanted to. Um, it loads a few dependencies. Um, one thing we're using is dummy data uh, because the NGR data is proprietary, but it will eventually be made public um, for the publication. But for now, it's, it's dummy data. Um, so it runs, you can set the number of samples, number of patients, it takes maybe two or three hours to do a thousand samples of a thousand patients. Um, I can run it now with 10 samples of a hundred patients and it should only take about half a minute. So for peace of mind, well, that, that's just nonsense stuff from data table. Um, but for peace of mind, the actual function announces which implants is going on, so you know if it's working or not. Um, yeah, so it's going to go through 12 different implants and it'll generate a comparison between them. So I did initially write this as lots of for loops, um, or even I think I'll apply just to get those thousand separate individuals. So I tried to move as much of a, as possible into HESIM, which has required ever more convoluted um, methods. Um, but the ultimate result is something that runs in a decent time. Um, so that's it, burns the 10 samples in that number of seconds, which isn't that slow, but it's not great either. And then, using BCEA to generate a SIAC, which should appear in the, yeah, so it looks mad because there's only 10 samples and 100 patients. And it looks more reasonable when you use more, um, but at least that, that, that it's working. And so you just need to run that NIPS main.r script if you want to run this model and you can feel free to download and modify and destroy um, if you want. Okay, um, so what have I learned? Um, quite a few things.
uh, using packages is usually a time saver, not always. In this case, I think it probably did save me time. I'm, I'm not sure though, um, but I think downsides. So I need to be more aware of what a package does before deciding to use it. Um, I didn't fully appreciate the limits regarding general micro simulation. Um, maybe it would have been easier to implement in base R in the first place. Um, but the upsides, and I have a much deeper understanding of both the PSIM package and state transition micro simulation and the differences between different types. Um, maybe more comfortable using HESIM code than using my own base R code, because I know Devin is an expert in developing these things, so base R would be a bit fishy, maybe. Um, the HESIM package, since my interaction with Devin has certainly improved as a result of the stress testing, and hopefully next year, he'll be presenting a package that does general micro simulation uh, from the off, in which case all of this will be redundant. Um, but that's everything from me. Just want to acknowledge this research was funded by um, the NHR, and that's the NIPS team. There's a lot of people involved, um, but that's that's everything from me. If there's any questions, all right. And we'll get the questions. You've touched on it there at the end, but if you were to go back again, would you? What would you do? Would you put yourself in, in base R and follow the separation? Yeah, uh, the question is, would I go back and do the same thing I did again, knowing now what I know now? Um, no, I would not. I, I, I would do it differently. Um, I now appreciate that continuous time state transition is the same as a DES, and writing a DES for this probably would have been a lot easier. Um, so I would just write in base R, use a bit of C++ to go faster, and then, yeah, so that, that's what I would do. But at least this way, the hacks will be incorporated in a future eSIM package so everyone else can use it. So I, I think that the benefit to the community outweighs the pain to myself. Um, yes. You're a marketer. <laughs> so, so for, the, for the community, do you, would you advise actually that this was the better way to go for the R community because it means that you get those links between people who built the original package and the people who a solution using those <laughs> um, yeah, so the question going forward, would I recommend to the community to take this approach of using existing packages? Um, for the community, I would say yes, please do that um, so that we can continue to build on what everyone has done before, continue to improve, continue to contribute, and then everyone will share in it. Um, if you're under time pressure, maybe not. But, um, uh, sorry, this was one question online. Um, Oh, no, it's just you look at the same thing. Nice. Uh, yes, Anthony? Cool. So, for those of you that haven't built a model car, can you describe like roughly how it looks as any scripts, so, like how many lines of code is it to bring that to the longer or shorter with yourself? So, just kind of, yeah, because I think it's one to go in that, and that, I never thought of setting the seat something like that. That would be interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, just describing the shape of it, if you don't mind. So, yeah, um, the shape of it is. Can you yeah. I think it's definitely shorter than if I'd written it myself, um, because in addition to most of most most of these functions are about setting up the model, what it looks like, and then um, so the main script is two hundred lines, um, but the actual model engine. is only 400 lines. So I, I'd estimate in total, it's about 1,000, 1,500 lines across all the different scripts. Um, if I was writing myself, it might only be another 200 lines. It's just those 200 lines would have been much more difficult to write. Um, and so this one. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, would you expect the cost effectiveness of results to differ for if you don't need micro model? Yes, yeah, so I, uh, that is um, the whole topic that Ishin is going to be taking on for her PhD is to see, do, do the Markov model and the micro simulation give the same results? If they don't, why do they defer? Um, so we're just now at the point where we're confident that our models are giving the correct answers it, with internally. Now we can go to the external validation and see if we actually agree with each other. Um, don't know. Yes. Uh, Someone's talking about uh, like, uh, fresh uh, starting to plan out to do uh, micro simulation. What's the advice? Uh, advice to start with this app or just dump, dump it to this 
So it depends on what type of micro simulation you want to do. If you're doing discrete event simulation, um, it might be easiest to go with the Simmer and DSM packages that already exist uh, rather than writing your own code. Um, if you're doing micro simulation state transition, it depends on the type of model. Like if your model is only truly semi Markov or Markov micro simulation, then HeSIM is definitely faster and easier. Um, but if you want to have more general things, then I would recommend going with base R until HeSIM is updated. 